Hello and welcome to episode 54 of the Page One Podcast. I'm Marco. I'm Tarek. And thanks for joining us at the Page One Podcast, where we like to speak to writers of all kinds about their careers, how they got into the business, and get as many hints and tips from them as possible. If this is your first episode of the Page One Podcast, please do check out our past episodes. We've got a lot there, um, all different kinds of writers, uh, comic writers, screenwriters, authors, video game writers. Last week we had a great episode with uh, the writer and director Alex Garland, so uh, do check that out if you haven't already. And we have another great guest this week, Tarek. We have an excellent guest. This week we are chatting with Matt Ruff, who is a eclectic writer. I Mm -hmm. think he's done thrillers, kind of science fiction-y kind of novels, most famous for Lovecraft Country, which was recently made into the TV show on HBO Sky Atlantic. And it was a really, really fun chat we had with him. Yeah, it was. And a really interesting one as well, because we talk about, in particular, Lovecraft Country and, you know, writing, you know, for those of you that maybe haven't seen Lovecraft Country or read it, it's it's a sort of mashup of of different ideas, sort of sci-fi and horror, uh, hence the Lovecraft (laughs) bit of the title. But it's set in 1950s America and it's uh, set around a cast of black characters. And so we talk a bit about writing diverse characters when you're not necessarily part of that diverse group, you know, because obviously there has been a bit of controversy about that uh, recently, about people writing stories that they're not entitled to write almost and yeah. and we get into a bit about that you know what are the limits there or is it about the respect that you pay to the characters when you're writing it is that the important part yeah because i mean matt, i mean matt ruff has he's done an excellent job mm-hmm. and and you don't he never seemed to receive any of the backlash that other authors have and it's interesting to kind of look at what what's the reason behind that yeah and uh, <laughs> Spoiler alert, it does come down to the fact that, <laughs> that, that you know, you put in proper research and you really write and care about the characters in a, in a proper way. It's not just a sort of fad thing that you're doing. I think, yeah. That, yeah. I think that's the, the main thing that we, we take from it. But it's a really interesting chat. So we'll get straight into it after a quick advert for our writer's notebook, uh, page one, which would make a very good Christmas present. It is the season to be giving. <laughs> exactly. Um, you can get a link in our in the podcast description about where to pick that up. But otherwise, it will get on with the podcast and we'll be back at the end of the podcast with a bit more chat. On with the podcast. The blank page. To some, it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome. But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? Structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying, or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made page one. Page one is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project, divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realised you need to plan how to let people read it. So we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a comic, or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, every story starts with page one. I 
I always begin these podcasts with the same question, which is, uh, did you always want to be a writer? But I actually read something that said that you had wanted to be a writer since you were the, since you were aged five. Is that correct? I mean, I, I say five, but basically I've been, I, I, I'm one of those people who just came wired from the factory knowing what they wanted to do. So <laughs> as long as I can remember, this is what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And uh, always long form fiction too, which is, you know, when I try to write short stories, they tend to string themselves together into larger mm -hmm. things. So um, turning into soap operas. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'd, I'd read somewhere that you, you, when you were starting out, you wrote a number of kind of false start novels and, one was a soap opera style novel of siblings. One was a fantasy novel, and and so it seemed that you 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 went through a number of novels to try and work out what suited you well or, or what style it worked for you. Well, basically, it was these were always long project. I mean, because it is a long a long project, I would start stuff and then run out of steam before it was done. And mm -hmm. I think that when I was young, in particular, I was I was an only child, and I was fascinated by the idea of big family. So I I did this very surreal. Um, it was kind of like a soap opera. It was about this family with eight kids and, and, you know, one chapter would be like, they were digging tunnels under the house. And then another one, they were infected with some sort of virus and are passing out in the hallways. And so it was just lots of weird stuff happening to this big family and not really having a, a plot or direction. This was when I was like, you know, nine or 10, yeah. I was writing this. And so I would just go on until I got bored and then I would go back and start it over again. And then, uh, yes. And I also at one point tried to write a, a very Tolkien and Dungeons and Dragons inspired fantasy novel that I think that came within a few chapters of being finished. And again, I just kind of got tired of it. And then the, the first book I actually completed was called the gospel according to St. Thomas, which was about this, a semi autobiographical story about a Lutheran minister's son who's losing his faith basically. And it right. was a, I wanted to let my parents know that I was not growing up to be the, the devout Lutheran that they'd hoped I would be. And I think because I actually had something to say in that when I actually finished it, it may not have been very good, but it mm -hmm. proved to me mm -hmm. that I could, I could f complete a long project. And that's the, that's the first hurdle to get over. I think of just to, you know, to, to prove to yourself that you can actually finish a long piece mm -hmm. of work. And then I was ready to start thinking about, okay, college is coming up at some point soon i'm going to actually have to start paying for my own food you know what do i what do i write that will allow me to do that um and then uh at cornell i took english with a concentration in creative writing which is actually a terrible uh choice if if <laughs> because I didn't want to be a teacher and that's really the only thing yeah. that that's good for. <laughs> and so basically what I was doing is I wanted the, the, the college experience and my goal was to get credit for what I was going to be doing anyway. And it did end up working out in that my, my senior thesis, which was, uh, became my first published novel. Um, I, I wrote Fool on the Hill in college and uh, one of my teachers, Alison Lurie, liked my work and said, you know, when you finish this, uh, send it to my agent in New York, Melanie Jackson, and see what she thinks. And I did, and Melanie loved it and sold it six months after I graduated. Amazing. So because, oh, that's fantastic. So that one act of, yeah, that one act of generosity on the part of one of my, my creative writing teachers sort of justified my whole college experience and made the mm -hmm. arguably foolish choice of studying creative writing work <laughs> out. But um, if that had not happened, yeah, I would have had, you know, a huge amount of student loan debt and, uh, you know, I would have probably ended up working in a video store or something like that. So, <laughs> so did did you had you attempted to get agents before then, or was that the was that the first route that you took and it worked out? No, I had not. Yeah, I had not tried to get an agent before then, and and it's probably good that it was handed to me because that that's the sort of practical aspect of careerism that, I, particularly at that age, I was just not very well equipped for. Mm -hmm. So I I don't know that I would have kept trying to find somebody, but it was just, it was just a, a perfect match. I mean, Melanie has been, you know, she's been my only agent the past 33 years. So, uh, and she's just been very good for me, it basically made my, my life and career possible. So, uh, that was just a, an incredibly fortunate break. One of several along the way that allowed me to keep doing this. Um, so yeah, the, the second break being that, you know, Full Nail was published in the States and then it, um, a woman named Anna Leuba at Karl Hansa Verlag in Germany got a copy of it and decided, you know, we should publish this in German. And so it was translated into German. I actually got to come over on book tour right after the Berlin Wall fell. Wow. Um, and 
for a long time, I was more popular in Germany than I was in the States. And that foreign money was one of the things that kept me afloat during my 20s when I was poor and not, you know, not doing very well otherwise. So, uh, yeah, it, it's just like every time I came close to having to get a real job, I was rescued by some weird windfall. <laughs> Brilliant. And, uh, so. well, it's interesting because, um, you know, I mean, obviously, I suppose you could you could view that on the one hand as you wrote your first book and it was picked up straight out, out of college and you were boom straight on your way. But the reality is, you know, you've that was the fourth or fifth book that you'd written or you'd started writing. And it wasn't it wasn't just a, your first attempt straight out, out, out the gate. You'd, you'd done a lot of soap opera books, the fantasy novel, the semi autobiographical novel. Um, and, and so obviously you must have taken stuff from those aborted first attempts that that, that helped you in your in your Fool on the Hill book that did actually go go somewhere? I mean, a lot of it was just I got the bad writing out of the way because mm -hmm. you, when you start, you just have a lot of bad habits and stuff and you sort of, and I think I, I may have in a weird way benefited from not having mentors to tell me what I couldn't do because I mm -hmm. liked doing weird things like, you know, combining elements from different genres or throwing different stories together. I mean, Fool on the Hill is basically... It's four different stories in one. I, I had a bunch of interesting story ideas that didn't add up to novels on their own. And I'm like, one day I'm like, well, what if I throw these all together with a framing story around them set at the Cornell campus, which becomes a, a character in its own right in the novel. And that should not have worked, but I turned out to have a knack for seeing connections between disparate things that ordinary people wouldn't think to fit together. And that served me very well throughout my career. And a lot of that was, yeah, just messing around with different stuff as a kid and, and seeing what I liked and what I didn't like and what worked and what didn't work. And so, yeah, a lot of it was just having, having time to write the crap that you inevitably write as you're mm -hmm. learning and, and while other people were paying my bills for me. So, uh, that, and did do you think, you know, was it, was writing those novels what taught you, you know, what let you find your voice and, and what you, what you wanted to do, or was it, the creative writing course was it, it sounds like it was more actually just the, the the graft of actually writing those novels and getting them out that yeah, pulled no, it your was, writing it was definitely the practice i mean i i again i the, the stuff i did in college was mostly just to get credit for what i was already doing mm -hmm. and um yeah i had just i found yeah it was like sort of finding my voice and then after i was published sort of refining it still further as i you know started getting more uh, professional uh, editorial advice and and critical pushback on stuff. So I, I you know, Full Nail has got very it's 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 got a lot. It's it's more accomplished probably than a lot of first novels, but it still does have that in good and bad ways that youthful edge where I just I was just in love with all of my cool ideas and just mm -hmm. threw in whatever occurred to me. And as I matured as a writer, I think by the time I wrote my third novel, I was more of like okay yes, this is an interesting idea, but it probably doesn't belong here. Let me reel that back in and let me not be quite so goofy here with this idea. And it's funny though, that there are, there are still plenty of fans who like, they love that, that first novel for its youthful energy. And then my later stuff is just a disappointment to them because I started doing not just, you know, more, more, more polished things, but also just different things where yeah. I, I, again, I just followed my my own instincts and wrote whatever I felt like writing rather than trying to stick to a particular genre or formula, which was fun for me. Um, not always fun for my publicist that I'm all over the map in terms of subject. Well, matter, I, I so. was, I was yeah. going to ask about that because obviously your, your books do, you know, the, the, a lot of our guests previously have written in a specific genre or might, might, dabble in something else occasionally but you know it's very you can sort of pigeonhole them into various things but your novels um are across a, a wide array of genre and i was going to ask how you get away with that because one thing that we've been told <laughs> is that um your yeah your publisher and your agent will be like no no people need to know what your books are like so they'll buy the next one so you should write if you're a crime writer you should write another crime novel and you have you kind of get stuck in that in that place well and part of that is just the way that yeah the way it works that they they base your success off book sale numbers and book mm -hmm. scan numbers and the problem is if you know you've got one very you know positive you know uh, popular series and then you write something different that will not have as many many numbers attached to it they, they don't treat those as separate books it all goes into your name and your account and they're mm -hmm. like well you you were successful now you're a failure because this book didn't do well so that's one reason why <laughs> they encourage you to find a brand and stick to it 
Um, part of that was just, again, not knowing that that was how it was supposed to be done. And, and part of it was I had the, again, good fortune of having a publisher who was willing me to mm -hmm. let me do that. Um, my, my first publisher and editor, Morgan Entrican, he basically with Fool on the Hill, he did a very smart thing where it, it was a college fantasy, but it was literary enough that you could sell it as literary fiction. And, and Morgan, like the, the first cover that was designed for that looked very much like a traditional fantasy novel, which I would have been fine with. And Morgan was like, well, no, 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 we don't want to do this because I, I think people who like fantasy will find this book without the cover's help. But what we want is the people who think they don't like fantasy, but will like this if we don't scare them away at the gate. And so he commissioned a more ambiguous cover that could be could be a fantasy novel, but could also be somewhat literary. And that was sort of, you know, saved me from um, what what a, a, another author I, I knew, he, he referred to it as the uh, the curse of the unicorn cover, where if you have <laughs> a classic fantasy, you know, cover with a unicorn on it, then you're stuck writing novels about unicorns and that kind of fantasy for the rest of your career. And I avoided that and had this more literary cover. And that was part of it is initially I was pegged as a sort of genre ask but literary writer and that you're allowed a little more latitude in where you go from there mm -hmm. and um so yeah my second novel was a science fiction satire of ayn rand's atlas shrugged and again that was that was somewhat there was you could sort of push that as literary even though right. it had all this weird stuff like a shark running loose in the new york city sewer <laughs> system and <laughs> And then by the time I did my third novel, which is Set This House in Order, which is a, about a relationship between two people who both have multiple personality disorder, I'd sort of backed into this reputation of being someone who never wrote the same book twice. And that kind of became my brand. Yeah. Um, yeah. And okay. so, uh, yeah, it was it was fortunate for me. It was not something I, I had planned. And I'm, I'm very lucky that that happened. And then by the time the publicist sort of stepped in and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're not going to be able to market this guy. <laughs> if he keeps doing different things, it was a little too late. So, um, yeah. And, and what's your, what's your writing style? Because I mean, if you've, if you're writing these books that kind of bounce around genres, you know, do you have a similar writing style every time or do you, or, or do you kind of think, no, this is, I want to go for this kind of tone here. So I'll, I need to change the way I think or the way I'm plotting or, or does it just kind of come out the way it comes out and ends up what it is? I, I definitely think about that kind of thing, but I think, you know, I, I, there are, there are with each book, you sort of set a level of, you know, like how, how realistic is this going to be? You know, what mm -hmm. sorts of crazy things am I going to allow for? And, you know, if it's written in first person, then I'll try to get the voice of the character in, in mm -hmm. a particular way, as opposed to the sort of narrator voice of third person. But um, that being said, having gone back and and sort of I had to I had to actually recheck the Fool in the Hill manuscript for um, because it had it had been converted to an ebook at a time when they were still scanning optically. So there were a lot of typos and people were writing to me to complain about it. So I forced my guess to go back and reread it and <laughs> check for typos. And one of the things that struck me was that there were certain quirks of language and phrases that I, I was using even back then. So mm -hmm. I, I would have, I would have guessed that my style had changed more and, and changed between books, but I think it's, it's more consistent than I realize. It's just that, um, you know, depending on what the book is about, it may feel different or it may come off differently, but I, I don't vary my style as much as I, I think I do. Um, so it's mostly a matter of what will what will fit this story and what won't and what am I going to talk about here and what am I not so you know um, it's interesting yeah. hearing about because I haven't read Fool on the Hill but um, just hearing about that it's these these different stories that you've put together um, you know with an overall story around them it makes me think of, of Lovecraft Country obviously is, is written in that same way of yeah. sort of little short stories that that become a whole story once once you read the whole thing i mean why why did you take that approach in these in these books i i you know that i mean in, in terms of with fool in the hill it was just i i i was in love with the campus and i wanted to set a story there and so i had you know um i had this story about a college of animals one of the things about cornell there's this myth that some um some alumnus left a ton of money to the campus on condition that dogs be allowed to roam freely there. And that's, that's not necessarily, I, I don't believe that's actually true, but you will see a lot of dogs roaming around. So I had a story about 
a college for dogs. And uh, then I had another story about, um, I was a big fan of the borrowers as a kid. So I had, a, I had a thing about these little people living in the bell tower and other parts of the campus that was inspired by a, a series of short stories I'd done when I was, I was very young. Um, and um, gosh, and then there was a story about the Bohemians, which was based on the, the artist at this dorm where I lived. It was an artist dorm and, and, um, and the framing story had to do with this semi-autobiographical writer in residence, Stephen George, who gets into a, basically a, a writing match with an, a retired Greek god who calls himself Mr. Sunshine. It's actually Apollo who comes to earth and messes with people's lives. And so by the, the way this all connected was that basically because it's a campus, because it's a place where a lot of different people from a lot of different points of view come together, it's just natural to combine these stories and that this this sort of godly storyteller would want to come down there and meddle with things. So that was sort of the start. And I actually managed to make that work and, and cap it off with a, a dragon coming to life. And <laughs> so in that case, it was just, it was just, you know, it was just, it just, that yeah. was, that was what occurred to me to do. Um, with Lovecraft Country, it was a bit more specific to what I was trying to do, where I had, I had initially pitched Lovecraft Country actually as a TV show, as, as a sort of X-Files, but um, set in Chicago in the 1950s. And instead of white FBI agents, it was about these black, this black mm -hmm. family who owned a travel agency and published a, a guide for black travelers called the Safe Negro Travel Guide. And they were getting caught up in weekly paranormal adventures, which is you know what the X-Files is like. Mm -hmm. And in converting that to a novel, I wanted to keep that idea of letting each of my main characters um, star in their own reimagined weird tale or science fiction tale. Uh, so, but I didn't want to write a book of short stories because I, first of all, that's not a thing that your publisher wants to hear about. You know, I didn't think that would be an easy thing to pitch even to my most tolerant publisher. And I wanted to do a novel. I wanted to have it all hang together. And what I eventually realized I could do is basically, instead of short stories, do episodes and have it be the literary equivalent of binge watching a season of TV. So I basically invented my own version of a TV show and and then back of my head thinking, okay, well, if this works, it could be proof of concept that really this would work as an actual TV show, which, which ended up working out quite well for me. <laughs> um, so in that case, it was more just specific to the idea where I wanted to keep this what I thought was a fairly critical idea of the inspiration that gave gave rise to the story in the first place and, and do it in literary form. So that was why I did it there. I mean, and there have been other novels that I've done where it's just one through line story with, you know, maybe a few yeah. subplots on the side. But I, I was just going to say with Lovecraft Country, it's not, a you know, sometimes you read the novel and you'll think, right, OK, this is I've seen this story before um, or whatever. And you, you're saying it's like the X-Files um, in uh, sort of mid twentieth century America with a with a black family, which is true, but it's not a pitch that that many people would have thought of. What what was it that? And that, of course, it's got all of the the monsters and stuff. But what is it that um that made you? What the hell made you think of this? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, basically, that's what I'm trying to ask. Yeah. Um, you know, it was just. I mean, I think it was partly. I just had always wanted to do. I'd, I'd been a fan of the X Files, and you know, to a lesser extent, Kolchak, the Night Stalker, which doesn't hold up as well. But, um, <laughs> but that kind of anthology storytelling had just always struck me as kind of an interesting thing thing to try my hand at. And I'd been offered this opportunity. Um, there were some TV producers who were fans of my novel, Bad Monkeys, and said, you know, pitch us original ideas. The sky's the limit. You know, edgy as you want, as crazy as you want, and. I, I knew they were, you know, their idea of edgy probably was not the same as mine, but I, <laughs> I decided to pretend that basically they're, that, that, you know, I could, I really could do whatever I wanted. I was like, let me think of ideas that would be, I think would make great TV if they were, were possible. And so this was just, I wanted to do a story kind of like that. And I wanted to come up with a different angle, a different set of protagonists. And mm -hmm. I had, you know, I had I had been reading this book by a guy named James Lowen called Sundown Towns, which is about the history of whites only communities in America. And um, from that, I had learned about the Green Book, which is the real life safe mm -hmm. Negro travel guide. It was this guide that was, uh, you know, published starting in 1936 and basically told African Americans where they could safely go in the U.S. And that just kind of fascinated me because I had never heard of that before. And it also hinted at this much larger infrastructure that. African Americans have created to sort of navigate the landscape of legal segregation. So right there, that seemed like an interesting story idea. And 
with the X-Files, one of the questions you have to ask is, you know, what is special about your protagonist that they're seeing monsters all the time? Because most of us, you know, you get mm-hmm. your one night in a haunted house and, you know, or one glimpse of the Loch Ness monster and that's your lifetime quota. So what's special about these people? And at some point it just occurred to me, well, what's special about them is that they're black in the U.S. in the 1950s. And when you're black in the U.S. in the 1950s, there's always a monster. Sometimes it's going to be, you know, the thing under the bed. Sometimes it's going to be... Uh, you know, policemen waiting by the side of the road just before dusk at a sundown town. And as soon as that idea occurred to me, I just thought this would be a fascinating story to tell where I'd be talking about two kinds of horror. And uh, in, and so you'd be able to balance this sort of paranormal horror against this sort of rich social subtext Um and, you know, that's just one of those ideas. As soon as it hits you, it's like right away, I just realized I, it, you could do neat things with that. And mm-hmm. at the same time, of course, I knew I'm, I'm pitching this to TV executives in, in 2007. So it's, yeah, it's going to be a largely black cast. It's going to be talking about racism every week. It's going to be a period piece. So it's going to be expensive. It's going to be a sci-fi show. So it's going to be expensive with all the special effects. So they're probably going to say no, but let me give it a shot anyway. And uh, sure enough, they said no. But um, by that point, I was just so in love with the idea. I was like, well, I'll, let me think about this a while and figure out a way to make it work as a novel. So um, and, and but that then, was the main thing was just, yeah, that that basic concept. As soon as I thought of it, it was like, yeah, those two things together will work. And and then you, you, you built in, presumably with that basic idea, you didn't bringing in Lovecraft with his history as well obviously ties in nicely into that that world that you're you're thinking yeah, the, of obviously the title the title came because I yeah I needed a a thematic bridge between paranormal horror and racism and and HP Lovecraft is of mm-hmm. course both of those things he's you know he's very influential and and you know talented horror writer but at the same time he's a white supremacist and mm-hmm. so Lovecraft Country became this kind of double entendre for uh, the paranormal landscape where, you know, monsters come from and then also white America in another sense. And so that, that, and then once I came up with a title, I started sort of more self-consciously, I mean, the, the plan was always to do multiple genres and you would have, yes, we'd have horror, but we'd also have science fiction yeah. and some fantasy. And, but once I, once I named check Lovecraft, I'm like, well, okay, of course I need a cabal of New England sorcerers who are up to no good. They can be the big bad, the main antagonist. And I'll come up with like my own version of a Necronomicon and my own version of a, a Shoggoth and so on. And so a few, few little breadcrumbs, but still, while still having a, a broader range of things we can include in this. And um, that, that again, just seemed to work for me. I, I don't know what the TV folks thought of that, but um and i i mean i i definitely wanted to ask about um about the reception that the book had when it first came out because obviously and and perhaps how that's maybe changed over time because we've seen we've seen people come under fire for writing books on topics that you know the internet say they're not qualified to write about and were you ever worried or did you ever receive any issues about writing about you know these kind of black issues as a as a white man I mean, I, I was obviously aware that that I would people would notice that, and if I did a lousy job, I assumed I would get you know more than the usual amount of angry emails about it. But um, I I think that the the key there is, I mean, there's two different groups of people you're dealing with. One is just black readers and viewers who are sick of having their hearts broken, yeah. of, you know, and they've. They've had other white authors who claimed, oh, I'm going to do the the black experience and, you know, praising, patting themselves on the back and then white reviewers saying, oh, this is so brilliant, <laughs> giving them credit simply for making the attempt. And then you read it and it's the same stereotype nonsense that yeah. you're already sick of, but yeah. writ large. And if you do that, then those readers are going to get very angry and they're going to let you know about it. Um, but if you do a good job, you'll do fine. It's just a question of basically, I, I was aware in that case, I would be playing to a tough crowd, but tough crowds can be won over and, and it's a good inspiration to not get lazy and to do your research mm-hmm. and, and think carefully. And, and I have found that if the if the story is good, people tend to overlook the the thing that they thought you were supposed to do and, and just, you know, they embrace it. Um, there is obviously a separate group. There are there's a subset of progressive liberals, and, and these are I find mostly white people who are trying to be gatekeepers and and say no 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 it doesn't matter whether you do a good job or not you just you should stay in your lane and yeah. 
those folks, they just, I, I, the thing is, if you, if you ignore them, they don't really have any power. If you don't get into fights with them publicly, I think that, again, the mistake is where people either go out of their way to say, yes, I'm doing this, this, uh, you know, reckless thing or this, this controversial thing. Ooh, come, come at me. Mm -hmm. Well, then you're asking for it or they, or they kind of buy into it and they apologize for not being the right color to write the story. And again, if you do that, you're opening the door to get, uh, you know, any, anybody who, anybody who wants to make an issue of it will then be on notice. Oh, this person is sensitive to those accusations. Let's go. I just wasn't interested in picking a fight and and I just wanted to, I, I thought I could do justice to the story. And I also, I've been doing this long enough that I thought if I couldn't do justice to the story, I would figure that out long before I embarrassed yeah. myself. Yeah. Like, so. And I mean, my, my books, if you look back, I mean, with the, the exception of my first, that my protagonists tend to be quite different for me. And that's just, again, another part of my style. I was never told that you couldn't do that. And I, I like the the challenge and the you know it's just interesting to me to use fiction to put myself in the heads of people who've mm -hmm. got different worldviews than I do and and I I find again as long as I I don't get lazy and, and do a decent job that's fine. Um, yeah, I mean I have to agree. I I as when I when I read the book and being as someone who's not a black man, but it felt very authentic. It it, it felt I you know I I felt that fear in the opening chapter when he gets pulled over by by the white cop and all that rang very true. Uh, to, I mean, it's difficult to see how true. I, I, I never experienced that, obviously, but yeah, I, I never felt because you do read fiction sometimes. You think that doesn't ring true. There's some kind of inauthenticity, inauthenticity about it. But I, 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 I really did feel that you nailed it. I mean, that's the goal, right? Is that I mean, I you you aim for a sense of psychological realism, and yeah, sure, you can never know completely what it's like to be in someone exactly. else's head, but exactly. that's not. That's not something that only affects people from different ethnic groups. No. I mean, I could, you know, I, there are members of my own family who I would have a very hard time. Like I, I always think of my maternal grandmother who was born in either Russia and the Ukraine in the 1890s, uh, emigrated to Brazil when she was still very young, spent most of her life in South America and eventually came to the U S and lived with us in, in, in very old age. And she's, you know, she would be a fascinating person to write about, but I would have a much harder time, getting inside her head that I did getting in any of the characters in Lovecraft mm -hmm. Country who, yes, they're black, but they're also, they're, they're working in middle-class English speaking yeah. Americans from the Midwest. I mean, there's plenty of common ground to work with there. And it, you know, it's just, you've got to learn, you've got to put in the time to learn what they were up against in terms of the historical discrimination they faced. And then think about how do you, you know, smart, resourceful people deal with these challenges. And it's, it's not, it's not simple, but it's not, you know, insufferably difficult and insurmountably yeah. difficult. So um, that's the thing. So and I think that's right because I mean, I think if you were to always stick to the, you know, write what you know line, then everybody, will, everybody, will, every man would only write about a man. We never write about a woman. We never try put themselves in a character who's not identical to them. And you, we have seen if it's done well with something like Watchmen was a recent example, I think, where yeah. you know, Linda Loft did a really, I thought, fantastic job of exploring that whole time frame and culture um and so yeah and, and i i think you're right i mean research is done properly you, 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 you can see when it doesn't work as well because uh, you know just if you take the example of a man writing about a woman you know i, I, I can think of books where you've you've read the story yeah. with the characters but and there are female characters in it but they're they're just they're, they're not authentic female yeah, characters it's a, they're, they're, it's a man people. yeah it's a man talking through them kind of a thing and i think that's where it falls down i think it, it, so it comes down to the writing i think and the approach you take to it well i think a lot of it has to do with interest i mean i, I like I, I remember reading um rereading recently robert penn warren's all the king's men and the which is a fictionalized story about huey long in the 1930s and the 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 narrator who is like the the fixer and associate for this fictional huey long character and the huey long character are both great characters the women in the novel not so much and and i i think the problem there was just that robert penn warren wasn't particularly interested in getting inside yeah. women's heads so he didn't didn't spend a lot of time imagining what they were really thinking and what it was like and mm -hmm. um and then the the black characters in the novel are basically just furniture they're not they don't you know they don't have names you basically know them except you know once in a while he mentioned a servant entering the room and it's just like and a lot of it is just i think the the personal interest of the author it's, it's you've got to want to do a good job that's another place i think where people get stuck is that they 
like once upon a while, like, you know, not that long ago, you could just say, if you're not interested in writing about women, you could say publicly, well, women don't interest me. I don't want to write about them. And, you know, people might be unhappy with you for saying that, but you, you would then go on. Now, nowadays, people know you do not talk that way publicly, but still, some people just find the idea of writing women or mm -hmm. writing people of color incredibly boring, and they'll do what they have to do to check the diversity box. But if you're, you know, if you're half-assing it, if you're just doing it to to get get through this chore so you can get back to the part of the novel you enjoy, then of course it's you know people are going to pick up on that. And so, so do you think do you think authors in some way are almost caught between a rock and a hard place where you know if they don't write about a diverse cast or topic, then they're maybe shunned for that for saying you know for instance if a man was to say I don't want to write about women because either they don't interest me or I don't feel like I do a good job of it, so they're kind of lambasted for that. But then if they do it and they do a bad job of it, they get lambasted for that. And is, 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 it, is it a tricky line right now to, to, to write about characters that are separate from yourself? I I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think a lot of this people, people imagine it as a big deal because of the, the cases where it blows up, everybody's talking about it. But yeah. the vast majority of books don't get that kind of scrutiny. And I, yeah. I think that again, if, if a story is well told, and people enjoy it, uh, then people are less likely to take a prosecutorial view and look for things to mm -hmm. go after. So if you, like if you, if you really just want to write male characters, then I, I would just don't announce that publicly. It's like, don't <laughs> invite people to don't insult women by saying, I don't find you interesting. And, yeah. um, but you know, if you, if you do want to include the, if you like, and I just think it's silly to leave half the human race plus, you know, a different ethnicity. I mean, the more options you have in telling a yeah. story, I think the better it'll be. Yeah, so absolutely. it's just like leaving a bunch of cool tools on the table. And I, I think that the, the advice I would give people, if you think you're not interested, figure out why, and then find a way to get interested, connect it to the things that you are interested in. And, you know, it, it's just, that's a thing that can be changed. I mean, you can, you yeah. can you can find ways to be interested in things and make a virtue out of needing to include stuff in your in your novel. So that that's the way I would approach it, rather than rather than seeing yourself caught between a rock and a hard place. Because again, I I think that most of the time when when I see this stuff blow up in public, it's just because somebody has gone out of their way to make themselves a target. Either they've yeah. either they've said something incredibly offensive, like ah I didn't want to write about that, or I just don't I I just don't find these people interesting, or yeah, they just, I, I don't know, they, they, they make a big deal about the fact nobody's going to tell me what I can write. Well, if you, as soon as you announce that, anybody who wants to tell you what they, you want to yeah. write is, is going to be looking yeah. for an excuse to come after you. But just, you know, keep your mouth shut, write a good book, and you'll probably be fine. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and when, you, when you're structuring a book like Lovecraft Country, which has these separate stories, but interconnected separate stories uh, how do you go about that i mean are you a person generally that that likes to outline quite a, a lot before you start writing and if you are do you do that for each little story or or do you just sort of start and see where it goes um i generally don't do written outlines because i feel like that's just writing the book twice and i'm I, i'm very good at keeping complicated things in my head so and I think there's, you know, that that's the main thing. I'm just too lazy to do heavy outlining. I I will, with this book, I'd like, it used to be that I would write in strict order. Um, it was just sort of an obsessive compulsive thing where I had to, I had to, I couldn't leave gaps behind me and that mm -hmm. slowed me down quite a bit. Um, the modular nation, nature of this book let me jump back and forth more. So I, I, I guess I had a, a loose outline in the sense that I had chapter headings and you know, every time I came up with a new story and roughly where it would go or a new chapter and where it would go, I would, I would fit it into the existing structure. So I had a pretty good idea of what stuff was going to be called and where it was going to go and who was going to be the star of the particular thing. And as that, I fit those pieces together. Um, but I did not do a master plan to start with. It was like, I knew, I knew the, the opening, how it was going to, I knew what my, my opening chapter was going to be. I had a, a very good idea of where I wanted to go in the end. I would, you know, everybody was get their get their story, and then in the end, they're all going to team up and mm -hmm. fight the big bad together. Um, but a lot of it in between, it was just sort of like, okay, what's the second story? What's the third story? And then as I went along, I started filling in gaps. So there were a lot of things I figured out along the way, and it, it's funny looking back. Certain things that 
I can't imagine the novel not having or things that I actually thought of after I had already started, mm-hmm. like the, the the significance of the Winter Palace. I I knew I wanted to do a haunted house story, mm-hmm. um, and I had you know where where a black woman buys a haunted what it gets a you know a suspiciously good deal on a haunted house in a white neighborhood. So it's a double threat where she's got neighbors who want to burn her out, and then the ghost is white too and doesn't want her there either, and she's got to play the dead off against the living. I thought that would be a cool story. My initial conception for that, though, was that it would be an older woman, um, maybe my protagonist's grandmother or his aunt. Um, the problem being that I, I didn't know what that woman was going to be doing during the rest of the novel. I had no place for mm-hmm. her. And my core cast was already getting pretty big. And then one day it occurred to me, well, I've got this character of Letitia who I don't have a story for. What if I plug her into there? And that led to a whole cascade of other thoughts about, well, where is she going to get the money? And, and the answer to that question led me to um, plot twists that later became very crucial to the novel. And then the, 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 the fact that the house had actually belonged to this wizard who ties into the big arc story. And so things that in hindsight, it's like, oh, he must have planned that out in advance. It's like, well, no, I had an idea. And then I figured out a way to make it fit as I went along. Um, and it was just funny how those elements would drop into place. But again, that's that's kind of my thing. I'm good at finding ways to make the pieces fit. Uh, and and do, you, do you find those pieces in the first draft? You know, do you, are you someone that, that tries to get a, quite a clean first draft at the end of it? Or do you get a first my, draft my, out my, and then f- go back? No, my first drafts are, are pretty close to most people's third or fourth drafts. Right. Because I'm constantly revising as I go along. I mean, again, I, I felt better jumping back and forth in this particular case. But there's still a thing where I don't, I, I'm uncomfortable leaving holes behind me so Mm -hmm. as you know i will go back and polish and polish and uh as new information comes in i'm like okay this has to be slightly changed to make this part fit um i'll be going back and revising so yeah by the time i get to the end of the book it's it's really very clean plus i just i i spell check obsessively i uh, so yeah, I, I've actually had a problem with copy editors where I, they don't have enough to do by the time they get my, <laughs> my version of the novel where I've, I've actually had to do my own style sheets to prevent overzealous copy editors from looking for things to fix because they don't like leaving five and 10 page gaps where there are literally no corrections mm. because it looks like they haven't been done doing their job. But the problem is that if you, if you don't tell them leave the punctuation the way it is, they will go looking for things like, well, do you really mean to have this comma there? Did you really mean, and it's Mm -hmm. like, and then I've got to think about all of that. And I just, yeah. So, um, so no, my first drafts are usually very clean by the time I'm done. And your, your latest book is um, 88 names and um, it's out now in hardback and paperback is coming out, I believe March, 2021. Yep. Um, And it's, it's kind of, pitched as a as part cyberpunk part romantic drama so i mean i think it's your genre mashup well and truly <laughs> back and formed and i wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about that book so this was this came out of the same tv pitch session that produced lovecraft Country. Oh, cool. the idea here was to to tell a story set entirely in virtual reality so that you would never see the characters as they actually appeared but only as they chose to present themselves and this this came out of a love of uh, computer gaming. I was basically trying to claw back some of the time I had wasted over the years. <laughs> um, and there's this phenomenon in, in online role-playing games called gold farming, which is basically where people collect gold and other virtual loot inside games and then sell it to other players for real money. And when I heard about that, that just seemed like kind of a fascinating uh, you know, much, much more fun than having a paper route. It's just sort of a way <laughs> yeah. of making money. And, and especially when I read about the difficulties that the game companies had in trying to like stamp it out because it, it yeah. creates all sorts of consumer uh, service, customer service problems where if people get burned on a deal. They will complain to the company and the company has to explain, this has nothing to do with us. We're sorry you didn't get, you know, <laughs> the magic sword you paid $400 yeah. for, but we're not involved in that. So <laughs> anyway, I, I came up with the idea of a more futuristic version of that. My, my character, John Chu, is what's known as a Sherpa. And basically, he will cater. If you, if you want to play a, an online role-playing game, but you have a life, so you don't have time to learn how to play or to build up a high-level character, he will basically cater an adventure for you. He will provide you with a ready-made, powerful character and a team of skilled players to come with you and just cater a night's adventure. And 
Um, so basically, that's his his day job, and uh, you know, of course, this is a violation of the customer service rules. So periodically, his accounts will get banned, but he's got multiple accounts, 88 names. So he'll just it's just part of the cost of doing business that periodically he'll he'll have to reboot himself. Um, so he gets a new client who goes by the name of Mr. Jones, who claims to be a wealthy, famous individual with powerful enemies, and he wants a, a comprehensive tour of the world of virtual reality gaming and is willing to pay $100,000 a week for this, which is, a, again, suspiciously a good deal, <laughs> but um, the guy is willing to pay the first week's pay up front, and it's the money's real, so John Chu takes the job, but as it goes along, he begins to suspect that that Mr. Jones is actually uh, Kim Jong Un, the uh, <laughs> North Korean dictator who's interested in VR for nefarious reasons. So, um, so yeah, in the novel, it's it's the first two thirds are set online in, in one or another virtual environment, and uh, everybody that John Chu is interacting with, not just Mr. Jones, but um, his coworkers and even his his ex girlfriend Darla are people he's never met in real life, and this is a world where cyber sex exists also. So you can you can have a fulfilling relationship with someone without ever meeting them in the flesh. And <laughs> so yeah, he's dealing with he's trying to figure out what Mr. Who Mr. Jones is and what he really wants. And there's a you know there's another character who's claiming Miss Pang who he suspects may be a, a member of the Chinese uh, intelligence, and then. Um, Somewhere in the background, his ex-girlfriend Darla is plotting revenge as well. So that's where the sort of twisted romantic comedy aspect of the story comes in. And uh, yeah, the first the first two thirds of the novel are set either in virtual chat rooms like you know Zoom but 3D, or in various gaming environments. And I wrote the novel specifically to be accessible and hopefully interesting, not just to people who are video game addicts, but to people who've never played a video game to save their life, because it's really about as much about the relationships between yeah. the characters and, and how you how you carry on in an environment where everyone is fundamentally a shapeshifter and you really don't know necessarily who you're dealing with. And so and then the the final third of the book, we come out into the real world and all the masks come off and we see what's really going on. So um, that's the basic premise of it. It was a lot of fun to write. It's it's lighter than Lovecraft Country, certainly in terms of subject matter, but I, I still there's some things to chew on in there about identity and, and the way we behave when we think we're anonymous or pseudonymous that, mm. that I think uh, even Lovecraft Country fans would probably get into. And it, it sounds like with these novels, you spend or you would have to spend quite a lot of time researching before you actually start start actually telling the story. I mean, do you do you, is that something yeah. you do or, or is it something that you just pick up from? daily life essentially i mean it, it varies depending on the book um i with lovecraft country i had to do quite a lot of research uh you know i i read a year's worth of back issues of the chicago defender which was the historic black newspaper um which gave me what people were were talking about in, in the time the novel takes place i did a lot of research into the the you know the history of tulsa which figures into the mm -hmm. the novel into mm -hmm the rules of the road, basically, if you were an African American traveling in the US at that time, and, and you know, like, how did you go about buying a house? And, you know, like, one of the challenges there being that um, the, the US government, the Federal Housing Administration would not insure mortgages in black neighborhoods or neighborhoods likely to become black. And if you can't get your mortgage insured, a bank won't give you one. So basically, if you were black, and you wanted to buy a house in the in the 1950s, you couldn't get a mortgage, you had to seek alternate financing. And Mm -hmm. which typically meant you would end up getting exploited. So things like that, like how would you do this? Um, I had to look those things up. And um, I'm fortunate in that my wife is a, uh, a rare book expert and professional researcher. So I, and I have her services for free. So <laughs> if, I, you know, if I need to know about redlining or some other thing, I can just say, can you, can you look this up for me? And she'll go to the library and come back with a stack of books, including everything I want and then stuff I, I didn't know I wanted that she's been <laughs> able to find. Um, with 88 names, there was there was less research, uh, just because I'm I'm already very well rehearsed in video game play. But there were some things about the way life works in North Korea, and that I spent some time on. But um, so it varies from book to book, um, you know. And then there are some books where I, I, all I'm doing is looking up, making sure I've got you know Las Vegas in the right county or yeah. whatever. But so and um, when 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 88 names came out, it was. You know, March 2020, kind of the yeah. cost of the COVID, and you know, I don't think we can have an episode where we don't ask about COVID. But <laughs> was it was it a good time to launch? And the fact that you kind of you missed just before it got real crazy, or was it was it a bad time? 
Um, it was it was probably terrible timing in general. I mean, I and I, I still look back with fondness at that naive period when <laughs> thought this was going to last a couple of weeks yeah. or you know maybe yeah. a month. It was yeah. just you know we'll go into we'll go into lockdown and this will die out. Ha ha ha. And you know then then there was that point too where it just I thought I could pick and choose which parts of my book tour to lose, and then it became very mm-hmm. clear very quickly that no, it's none of it's going to happen except the stuff that can be done online. My one advantage was that because I had written this book about life in VR, uh, I had set up a lot of online stuff already mm-hmm. uh, connected to it. Like I'd actually done a, a, a uh, fun interview with this, uh, what's called the Drax Files Radio Hour. It's a, a German-based uh, interview program in Sansar, which is the 3D version, the VR version of Second Life. So oh, I actually did an yeah. interview wearing the <laughs> Oculus goggles, talking. I'm in Seattle. My interview is in Munich, and we are in this virtual space, and I'm wearing an avatar based on Bad Monkey. So I'm a, I'm a talking mandrel in a jean jacket. And, uh, <laughs> That was a really cool experience, and that happened in part because of what I'd written about. So that and and other other things just made it easier for me to transition. We did a podcast to to help promote uh, eighty eight names, and that was already pretty much in the can by the time COVID became an issue. So that was that was ready to go. So I was better positioned than most people, but I think it still depressed uh, sales in general. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, you know, I've I I had a much better year with the Lovecraft Country HBO series and I did with the launch of 88 Names. But, you know, we'll, we'll have another bite at the Apple uh, next March yeah. when the paperback comes out. And yep. the fact that my profile is higher now because of the, the success of Lovecraft Country is, is certainly uh, going to help with that. But And with, with, the, with the TV series for Lovecraft Country, how involved were you in that? You know, did, were you a consultant? Did you write screenplays? Or what, what was your involvement? My, my official title, I think, is executive consultant. And basically, I, you know, I had the option if I had wanted to, I could have moved to L.A. and joined the writer's room. And I really, really did not want to do that. Um, I First of all, I'm just not qualified. I don't know anything about writing in TV. I'm not. And I knew Misha Green, the showrunner, was going to have her own ideas about what she wanted. Mm-hmm. And she didn't need me looking over her shoulder. So basically, I gave her my my research notes and uh, a couple of documents I created, one detailing all everything I knew about the characters and how they're related to one another and another talking about how magic work and, and various other things in, in the novel and just why I, the choices, why I'd made the choices I'd made. And I said, here, take this stuff. You know, if you have any questions, you know, I'm here for you, but you know, uh, take what you want, leave the rest. I know you're gonna have your own ideas of what to do and I don't wanna step on your toes about this. And that turned out to be, I think the right choice mm-hmm. that, um, Misha basically, yeah, she had her own very, very specific ideas about where she wanted to take the show, and I'm, I'm happy with the way it turned out. So, um, is it kind of nervous? Is it nerve wracking even? Um, you know, handing this over to someone else and seeing, you know, it might be, you know, it might change the way it looks in the end, or they might change some character stuff or plot details, is it, or is that quite exciting to see what happens? I, I mean, my, my, my standard answer before it ever happened was that, well, my book is, you know, my book is already, my version of the story mm-hmm. is told and it's not yeah. going to change and yeah. I can always point to it. It's one thing to say that it's quite another to actually have the experience and you don't really know until it happens. And I'm, mm-hmm. I was very pleased to find out that at least in this case where they did a really good job, I thought it, it's quite easy for me to not be territorial and say, ah, no, this is fine. This is, I'm, yeah. I'm cool with the changes. And um, I, I have yet to have the experience where somebody butchers the book. Then I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how I would respond in that case. I suspect the hardest part would just not be saying what you thought because there yeah. are, uh, thanks to Anne Rice, I believe there is now, there's now <laughs> boilerplate language when you when you option your book that you will not disparage the production. So, um, so generally, if you if you do ever see a production and the author is not saying much about what they think, that probably means they right. hated it, okay. but they they yep. cannot say so. Uh, but but in this case, yeah, I was I was I it was really exciting and a lot of fun. And I mean, the the pilot set the tone right away. It's like yeah, it, it, yeah absolutely captured the spirit of the book really well while not being afraid to change things up and move things around and i so i was on board from the first um yeah. and uh yeah i was really happy with it so and they did a nice job of name checking this whole concept of multiverses and then they have you know a character find a a copy of lovecraft country not written by me written by the unborn son of one of the other characters but it sounds suspiciously like my novel so <laughs> 
No, it's it's a it, it was I thought it was a, it was a very interesting way of yeah, as you say, changing up little things, moving things around a bit, you know, and and I suppose knowing what works well for TV isn't always the same as what works well in a book, and, and playing to the strengths of each of those media. Oh, sure, sure, and I mean, you can see that even in the. That was part of what fascinated me because I, I know nothing about the the visual language in particular. Storytelling is still you know a dialect I have not picked up, and so. Mm-hmm. It was just fascinating, like in the opening thing in, in the novel, it's Atticus is driving home from Florida mm-hmm. to Chicago yeah. in a car alone. In the in the in the series, they they put him on a bus. And the, mm-hmm. the main reason is because there he has someone to talk to. Yeah. Because yeah. You, you're not unless you do heavy voiceover, you you can't do yeah. the introspection you can in a novel. So it's like and then there's this tracking shot at the beginning where they pull back and you see the sign in the bus saying, you know, this section of the carriage reserved for members of the colored race. And so right away, it tells you everything you need to know without uh, narration. And yeah. that was yeah. fascinating to see. And, and other cases where they were fine to just, you know, you don't need to connect all of the dots. You need just, you need to get the characters from one place to another. You don't need to explain everything that happened. And film and tv lets you do that in a way that that doesn't work quite as as easily in in you know in in a novel so that was just the the, the translation process was fascinating to watch but but is tv because obviously you were saying that obviously lovecraft country and uh, 88 names came out of things that you were pitching to tv is is that something that you would like to 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 work in at some point um i think that the main issue is that i just I'm just so used to working alone. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I, I don't know that I play that well with others. I could see maybe doing a, a, a movie script mm-hmm. where you, you know, but the idea of, again, the, the TV, I mean, they, they really do. It's, it's, it was interesting visiting the set and just seeing what the life is like. I think if I were starting over as a young person, again, that might be a fun line to pursue, mm-hmm. but um, the idea of going into a writer's room and haggling with, you know, half a dozen to a dozen other people over what's going to happen and, yeah. and, you know, getting into arguments about stuff. I don't know. I don't, I don't know that, that that would be my thing. Um, I, I could see, you know, pitching basic ideas and maybe writing a Bible, but again, it's just, I'm, I'm probably not the right person to, to develop that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I could come up with cool ideas and I could probably do a, a good script, but then it's, it's really up to other people's interpretation. Uh, so what about something like a graphic novel? I could see a lot of your ideas working well in, in the kind of illustrated page. That would be, that's something else that's funny. I've had, I've had a couple of interested parties ask about that. And there's another thing where I'd have to learn how to do it because yeah. I, you, there too, you, you were kind of writing a script, but there's that, that's something I might want to try at some point. It would basically, I think I, I would want to come up, if I came up with an idea that, that, would work in that format i might consider it uh, it i again i don't know about translating something i've already written to that format mm-hmm. would be weird because i mm-hmm. again i'm i'm so locked into the way novels work and what i can do with novels i think i would have to come up with a fresh idea and and specifically go in with the idea of okay i'm going to try and make this work as a graphic novel learning as i go yeah. um cool. but yeah it's just fascinating that these different Every time, every time you get sort of invited or, or get a, get a glimpse of a, a way a different medium works, and just learning the rules is fascinating. Like one yeah. of my one of my earlier novels, set this house in order, has been optioned for opera. And oh wow, um, a guy named Nico Muley, uh, he's a this wunderkind uh, composer in New York, and uh, he optioned it for opera. And part of the cool learning experience for that is that the, again, there's a whole different set of rules for the way the optioning process works and the. Um, I think opera has as long a lead time as Hollywood. Like TV comes, if you if you get stuff for TV, that tends to progress fairly quickly. Movies can take years to set up and opera is similar. Mm-hmm. We're just getting all the moving parts <laughs> in place to make an opera happen can can take a long time. But That's not, just, I've never heard of that before. That must be quite an unusual option. It was unusual. Yeah. It was very unusual, but um, yeah, they... CAA, they they had to go to a special agent who just deals with theater and and opera. So that my, wow. they, they they had all an expertise. So it was, that was just that was just sort of fascinating just to see what the contract for that looks yeah, like. Yeah, that's so, very cool. Yeah. And and what what is next after eighty eight names then? Um... I have been I have been teasing the possibility of doing more Lovecraft Country books, and I, I think uh, you know I'm not normally a uh, a sequel guy, but this may prove to be the exception. And I, I if I'm ever going to do it, it's got to be now. So mm-hmm. what I'm 
when I'm done with the, the last of the PR that's sort of tailing off the end of the, uh, the HBO series, I'm gonna go back. I've got about 25,000 words of a prospective sequel. I think I need to write another 25,000. Then I will show it to my, my agent and my editor and say, okay, this is my plan. And the, 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 main, the main hitch is that if I go back, it's not gonna be one more book. It's gonna be two or possibly three mm, okay. carrying the story forward. And that is a big commitment in time and effort, particularly mm -hmm. because I write so slowly. Although, as my, my friend Christopher Moore pointed out, it's if you're writing if you're writing in the same world as before, you at least don't have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. You already know how everything works. You can probably yeah. proceed faster. And as soon as he said that, I was like, yeah, you know, that actually makes a lot of sense. So I would like to do that. And or at the very least, if it's not going to work, I, I need to give it my best possible try so that it, when I'm, you know, 70 and, and you know starting to forget my name, I won't be saying, oh, if only I had done that <laughs> sequel when I had the chance, you know. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and that'll, that'll be my next, my next project to see if I can go anywhere with that. And then if, if, you know, depending either I'll be doing that next or I will come up with something completely different, but if it is something completely different, I don't know what that will be yet. Hey, right, cool. What was the last book that you read? Wow. Um, Actually, the, the last the last book that I read, I uh, I got a book on, um, and I'm blanking on the name of the author, but it's a book about confections and chocolate. It's a cookbook, but it's basically a, a Culinary Institute of America book on how do you it, like my, my I, I have this thing I want to make chocolate candies, and so and I don't know how to temper chocolate, so my wife sent me a. a uh, an article about how to how to temper chocolate using a sous vide machine, which is a weird thing, but and that had a link to this book, and it's basically just a rundown of all the chemistry behind chocolate mm. and how that works, and all of the all of the basically how to make everything from pillow mints to pulled sugar <laughs> to to candy ribbons to your own homemade candy bars, and so that is that is actually the last book I read, and this is a a. A subgenre of things I like to read is is books of weird, you know, books of knowledge that teach me about stuff that I might in another life have wanted to mess around in, and trivia books that teach me cool things. And like, I may never actually make my own candy bars at well, home. But I was this will ask, probably happy. find its way into a. <laughs> this will probably find its way into a novel. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. And the the most recent uh, fiction I read was uh, actually Shakespeare for Squirrels um, because I, I did a, a an event with Christopher Moore and uh, we were talking about that. So I, I read uh, I read Shakespeare for Squirrels, which was a lot of fun. Nice. Um, uh, and what was the last film that you watched? Uh, gosh, I should be able to remember this because I watch crappy horror movies all the time. Um, it's a question of which one. Um, well, last night we were watching the Haunting of Bly Manor. It's not a it's not oh, a yeah. movie, but it's a yep. it's an extended yeah. So we've been watching that on, and my wife kind of bailed out. It's it's a little too scary for her, so I will probably <laughs> continue watching that. Well, well I I just finished watching that myself actually, and I enjoyed it, but I I didn't think it was as good as Hill House. Hill House I thought was up there with a close to perfect show for me almost. Mike, yeah, Mike Flanagan, I, I like a lot. I, I, I loved Haunting of Hill House. The, the only thing I was a little off on was the ending because I, I think I do prefer Shirley Jackson's. They kind of rewrote yeah. her last yeah. line and I, I I kind of like the, the I don't know, I don't know if you call it nihilism or just the grimness of, mm -hmm. of Jackson's. Whereas I felt like the ending of Haunting of Hill House in, in the Netflix version, it wasn't a happy ending exactly, but it sort of created this idea that there was something positive about being trapped yeah. in the house forever that it didn't quite yeah. sit with me, but I, I still thought it was a great show. Yeah. Cool. Um, um, and uh, the veil also. No, no, I, I was, I was, well, cause we do normally ask what was the last TV show you watched as well, but you've kind <laughs> of answered that. So um, the, the very last thing that, that we do is um, a, an either or. So there's no right answers, as Tarek likes to say, apart from to one of the questions. But um, a, if we say a fantasy or sci-fi? Sci-fi. Uh, eat in or go out? I'm sorry, what's the second one? Go out. Is it like eat in, like a you know, fancy restaurant? Oh, or, oh eat or in or go out. Yeah, uh, yeah. Eat in. Nice. Especially now, yeah. yes. <laughs> uh, well, this one that is one's easy. This one's influenced <laughs> by COVID as well, perhaps. But TV or cinema in normal times, perhaps. TV, actually, even in normal times. Okay. And the uh, last one: real book or ebook? Ooh, 
probably real book, but boy, it's close. Uh, that's fair enough. I'm uh, I'm always arguing for the ebook, but uh, that's that's if it's I love I, I'll take that. I, I mean, I love I love ebooks. The 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 ability to carry a portable library with mm -hmm. you and and get whatever you want wherever you want. But again, my my wife was a rare book dealer, and oh, okay, there enough. are certain things with the physical books, particularly the ones that, that either haven't made it to ebook or really can't be translated because they they just don't work on the yeah. screen. There are some amazing yeah. physical volumes I've seen in my lifetime, and those are yeah that 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 artwork. That's another thing. At some at some point, I'm sure I will explore. You know, books on book binding and that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, well, like something like a, a House of Leaves by uh, Daniel yeah. Dan yeah, Dan Dan Levski. Would that wouldn't work on a, a Kindle, I don't think. It maybe is. I, I have a yeah. I have I have a, a book called the the most expensive book in my library. It's called the Codex Serafinianus, and it's basically a uh, an alien encyclopedia. This guy, uh, this Italian artist, created a a book, and it's like there's no text. It's just you, you look through it, and it's it's got an alien alphabet and All right. uh, oh, wow. these really wild pictures, and it's uh, it's just a gorgeous thing, and you. You could you could reproduce it. You could scan the images, but there's just something about having it in your yeah. hands and paging yeah. through it. And yeah. it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's okay. great. All right, okay, so well, I believe that that's a draw. I think. <laughs> yeah, you can have half yes. the point there. <laughs> <laughs>
and our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later.